Come on, let's lift up the name of Jesus Christ. There is none other in heaven or on earth. Welcome to another episode of Hope in Christ with Denise. Here on Kingdom Influencers Broadcast, where we place our hope in the only hope there is. Christ our Lord. Welcome, 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 welcome back to Hope in Christ with Denise here on Kingdom Enforcers Broadcast. I am your host, Pastor Denise, founder of Hope in Christ Ministries, and I welcome you all back to today's show. Today we have a phenomenal Christian author that will be sharing with us. Before we begin with our author, we'll begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again for this time We thank you for another opportunity to spread the gospel. We thank you, Lord God, for your woman of God and for those that are listening, oh God. And we always pray, Father God, that someone will hear something that they will come to hope in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we thank you and we give you glory, give you honor, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you all for tuning in to Hope in Christ with Denise here on Kingdom Enforcers Broadcast. Remember that at Hope in Christ, we are healthy, overcomers, purpose, and we maintain an eternal perspective in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, again, today we have a special guest on the show, and she will be sharing with us. Mrs. Muriel Gladney will be with us today to share a little bit about her new book, and we welcome you, Ms. Muriel Kane. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Denise. Um, as uh, I am Muriel Gladney, author, uh, speaker, and uh, inspiration coach of joy in Jesus. Uh, a little bit about me, I was an atheist. Uh, in other words, it wasn't about not believing in God. He didn't exist uh, until I was 52. And at that age, uh, he surprised me with the confirmation that, in fact, he did exist and that we, the creation, mankind, are really, truly his creation. So that was a uh, surprise is not the correct word for that. But from that moment on, that was 1995, and it has been a journey, an unbelievable journey. Today I am an author of three books. So thank you for inviting me on the show. Amen. Thank you. And I am so grateful that God is so faithful to us, even when we don't even know. And so I'm grateful for even that testimony to hear more about it. So, Ms. Uh, Muriel, can you please share with us the title of your new book and tell us about it? This latest book is called We Are One, and for those who go online to look it up, uh, (laughs) the Holy Spirit gave me a picture of a heart with women, three faces of women in it, because one of the things that I've learned over these 25 years is that regardless of the foolishness of the people here on earth, the devil is not prejudiced. So he doesn't care what color you are, what church you go to, what denomination you belong to. His goal is to destroy us. So this book actually has several stories of women who the devil did everything he could to destroy them. Uh, Several of them survived intact faith-wise. Others have a very difficult time because it is the persecution and just life in general that the devil uses to sway us and get us to think that God is not faithful, that he doesn't love us, and yet that is a lie. It was a lie from the beginning and it still is today. So this book uh, actually has something very special in it besides the stories of these women, and I call it the IPS system because when we get this IPS system in place, it doesn't matter 
what trial or tribulation or persecution that the devil throws at us, we're standing strong like that tree in Psalms 1 where the roots are rooted so deep in Satan, you might sway us at the top, but we're so rooted you cannot uproot us. And that's what this book is really about. Wow, wow, wow. And so you said the IPS system. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that? A little, because I really want people to read it. But one of the things that I have discovered over these same 25 years, because uh, at the time he brought me in, I knew no scriptures. My life had been such to where, as an adult, you couldn't talk to me about God, and no Bible was allowed in my house. So when he called me in in 1995, I knew one Bible character, and that was Moses, and that was from a movie. So I started from scratch. And it was a surprise to me how the scriptures, even though they're minimum, we know, 2,000 years old and more, they are applicable today. They're just as true today as they were when he wrote it. Uh, for instance, uh, in Isaiah 65 and 1, uh, I call him Yahweh. I try to call him by his name because God is not his name. But he says, I will be found by those who are not even looking for me. I was not looking for him. But uh, I tell people, he must have said, okay, she's been in the world 52 years. Now it's time to go to work for me. So <laughs> when he opened up my spiritual eyes and heart to his existence, he also confirmed that we are so special made you know, he says we are wonderfully made, and we really are, and that he loves us. And so that has been the foundational uh, basis of literally everything I've written and everything I talk about, that Jesus did not come after us uh, out of pity. He came out after us out of love because the Father never stopped loving us. You know how when our kids act a nut, you know, by the time they get to be teenagers and they think they're all of that and three bags of chip, <laughs> and we throw them out of the house, right? But after we throw them out of the house, we call all the relatives, all the neighbors. We have half the town looking out for the kid, even though the kid doesn't know it. That's kind of like what our Heavenly Father did. He put us out of our original home. But he immediately started taking care of us. He had to make a clothing for Adam and Eve. And then Jesus says he was prepared for this purpose from the very beginning. So he's never stopped looking out for us. And he set this magnificent plan of redemption in place that just astounds us. But it's all based on, I tell people, the gift of life that Jesus gave us is an unimaginable gift of love. And he was the only one who could do it. And he did it without wavering. Now, that's love. Amen, amen, amen. I, I, I want to read the book now. I'm really like, wow, wow, because um, it's amazing to hear what God has done in your life. And like you said, it's in love. He's not just um, chasing after us for no reason, but it was all in love. And I had um, the experience of God chasing after me when I was, you know, just lost. And um, so it's amazing um, to hear your story. So one of my questions that I don't have written down, but it is um, just kind of connected to your background. So if someone who does not believe God exists, um, if you were having a conversation with them and having knowing that God revealed himself to you and you you now understand that he does exist, what advice would you give to that individual to cause them or to draw them to Christ? Well, what you have to do is pique their interest because I've had people ask me, um, 
how did I turn my life around? And I said, I didn't. It wasn't me. You know, Jesus made it clear that uh, the Holy Spirit is the one who's going to be our guide, our instructor, our corrector, (laughs) because if you read my first and second book, uh, I was actually, I won't say arguing, but I had slight disagreements with uh, the Holy Spirit, uh, especially when it came to uh, honoring and forgiving the person who had so completely altered my life through abuse. But he didn't back up, even though I was just like, uh, no, uh, I don't think so, no. But he kept showing me through his word. So if I'm talking to someone who's really having issues um, about understanding the scriptures, it doesn't make sense to a person who doesn't believe to quote them a scripture. Jesus always used practical solutions, you know, like farming and things like that. So one person came to me and said, well, I don't believe the Bible has to do with anything, you know, that I'm in control of my life, you know, and and on and on and on. I understood this conversation because that's how I felt. And then what I told him, I said, okay, I said, if you're so completely in control of your life and this has nothing to do with God, don't die. And the person said, what? And I said, well, I said, if I, if you're in control of your life and I'm in control of my life and there is no God, uh, supreme God, don't die. He said, well, that's crazy. I said, well, but you're in control. I said, you know, when I'm in control of something, I control it. So what I told him, I said, the point I'm trying to get you to understand is that there is no guarantee. I said, when we go to bed at night and we wake up in the morning, the alarm clock didn't wake us up, which I used to think. But by the grace of God, through his favor, he woke us up, and he's, and so he said, well, I'm not sure about that. I said, well, I'm sure that during the night a multitude of people went to bed, had all kind of plans for the next day, but they didn't wake up. Go and ask their families why they didn't wake up, because if we're in control, then we make all the plans, we make all the decisions, and we determine exactly what's happening. And the person kind of got that point. He said, okay, I got it. So you have to use practical things with a a person who doesn't believe that there is a God because quoting scriptures to them simply loses them, and they will just get that glazed look in their eye, (laughs) and then they'll change the conversation because you can't talk spiritual to a person who has no clue about what's going on in the spiritual realm. Wow, 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 wow. So that's, yes, that that does make sense. I I just remember having conversations with individuals that I even went to school with, and and I'm like, wow, how did you get to that place? But, um, yeah, that's true, because they're like, well, I don't believe in the Bible anyway, so... Why are you even talking to me about that? So, yeah, that does make sense. Um, Thank you for sharing that. So my next question is, um, what are your other goals and dreams, other than being an author, what are some goals and dreams that you have? Well, (laughs) it's it's funny that you ask that. I have been – I do Facebook posts as well, um, but I do only Christian posts. And I've been doing it for uh, several years now. And I draw little pictures and things like that, and then I put scriptures with them. And over the past few months, it's really been touching my heart that as Christians, Jesus says, I came that you might have joy and life. But when you look at many of us, who profess to be Christians, we look so unhappy 
that I can, that you know, I can see why. Who would want to follow somebody that looks like they're absolutely miserable all the time? And I know life is hard. I am not saying that, you know, some of the things that we go through are not difficult. But all through the scriptures, Jesus says, when you truly put your trust in me, then be joyful, be happy. And so that's been my agenda over the past couple of months to do a ministry about joy and that you don't let anything in life, nothing that the devil throws at you, and that goes back to this book, because some of the stories in this book, which are true stories of women, one in particular is going to make you just cry because you cannot help but wonder, I did. How in the world did you survive this? But she did, and strong in faith, strong. And so I'm telling people, if Jesus could go through what he went through, you know, how are we going to complain? I mean, last time I looked, I hadn't been put up on a cross. No stakes are driven through my hands and feet, you know, stabbed in the side with a, you know. I haven't got beat uh, to where my skin was just literally peeled off of me. Yes, I've had some things happen. Other people have had things happen. But I tell people, yes, the devil can affect our physical body, but you know what he can't touch, Pastor Denise? He cannot touch my spiritual body, and that's where my joy is at. And I just experienced that this past week uh, because I had to go to a conference, and um I have this, uh, it's a form of rheumatoid arthritis, is what the doctors say, uh, simple name, gout. But I had a flare-up that was unlike anything I had ever experienced. Every bone in my body that I have damaged in all of my 70-something years swole up, inflamed, and I could barely walk. Now, this was like Wednesday night. On top of that, I had a fever. And <laughs> so I'm laying in the bed like, you are a lie, Satan. I bet you I'm going to this conference. We're leaving uh, Thursday morning. This is Wednesday night. I'm sick. Throwing up, I mean, the whole ball of wax. So I, the only way I could get to the car, I almost didn't have crutches. I had to almost crawl to the car. But I went to this conference because I knew that something was going to happen. I didn't know what. I had my books with me. Didn't sell a lot of books. But I met a young lady. God had this thing set up, and I met a young lady that I had met last year. And she was a vendor, and I was a vendor, both of us last year. She was, what, 27, 28 years old. And she was selling these little pamphlets, like, if you will, words of encouragement, lift, you know, be strong, be courageous, but no scriptures. So during one of the breaks, I asked her, could I, you know, could we talk? And I said, why don't you have scriptures on those little cards? It was like maybe about 20 cards in, in each pack with all kind of words of motivation, encouragement, you can succeed, but no scriptures. And people were bought, bought her out, cleaned her out. She said, well, I don't think scriptures are necessary. You know, all people need to do is feel, is they need to feel that they can do it. Between last year and this year, she had just gotten married. She wanted to have a baby. Everything went wrong in her body, everything. And they finally told her she was not going to have any kids. This year at the conference, she got up and gave a testimony, and she said she started leaning on the word standing on the promises of Jesus and calling the name of Jesus over all of these different names. I mean, it was like three or four different diseases, and I mean, you name it. In other words, she was not going to have a child. Today she's three months pregnant because she de declared and decreed the word of God over her situation. 
So during one of the breaks at the conference, uh, we got a chance to talk, and she just, she so filled my heart. She said, thank you. She said, I knew what to do because of our talk last year about the importance of the Word of God. That's why God had me go to that conference. That's why the devil didn't want me to go. Wow, 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 wow. Yes, that is so true. And we see, you know, just in the world that the world has gotten kind of in that direction where you use inspirational words and but that word, when the enemy come at you, you got to have something to stand on, and that's, that's so true. Um, um, it, it's amazing how God brings you to a place and um, not to harm you. He says, my thoughts are not to harm you. And, um, and so that's amazing that even in all of that, she has a great testimony. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and she's young. So I told her, I said, you need to give this testimony every place you go in your generation. Wow, wow. And so that leads me into my next question, Ms. Muriel. Uh, what is your favorite scripture? If you could say my favorite scripture or maybe scriptures, uh, what would they be? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> the one that always comes to mind is Psalms 32, Uh, and people say, why that one? And I say, because we have, we're blessed with a testimony from King David, and we don't know what this was about. We don't know if that was about Bathsheba, but in that psalm, he's telling God that he feels his absence. He has done something. And he says, I feel your absence. I mean, he is I mean, he is talking to God about, you know, you're not with me. I feel it, your absence. I need you. But here's what King David did in that psalm. He wrote down for us God's reply to him. And God told him, well, then stop acting like a horse or a mule. And Pastor Denise, I had to stop and like, what? What's up? Because I didn't grow up in the country. You know, my mother grew up in the South, but I didn't. So I had to look up, why would God use, remember I said practical things. They said because a horse or a mule will not come to its owner voluntarily. You have to make them come. So basically God was telling King David, if you would stop disobeying me, that all these other things wouldn't be happening to you. And then God's promise, he says, now I'll be with you. And then King David said, whoo, I'm going to give this testimony to everybody. (laughs) So that's one because it's so applied in my situation because I did not understand that there can only be one God, you know, one King Jesus, and one Holy Spirit, and, and he didn't ask me about being co-ruler. <laughs> See, I had been used to running my life, so I thought, you know, for a long time. So I had to learn some hard lessons sometimes about, excuse me, who's in control here? And so when I finally learned, sit back, let go, and let God, it's like, oh, You got this. (laughs) He said, I got this. (laughs) Wow, wow, wow. Um, Another question that that, um, popped in my head, because I I, I think it would be amazing. Have you ever thought about doing Bible study with women, just just general Bible study and um, gathering women together? That's just a question that maybe, you know, you may have thought no, about. No, I do. In fact, I don't do it on because our where I worship has regular Bible study with the uh, First Lady of the church, but I have done sporadic Bible studies. Uh, I call them seminars, but basically they're Bible studies. And uh, I've had three today, and I'll probably, I do about every three months, 
And what I do especially is I take them down the road that the Holy Spirit took me down. I don't just read the English translations. Uh, I try to find out, in fact, I have a computer Bible that gives me both. I get the English, the uh, Hebrew, and the interlineal of the Greek. And a lot of times the interpretation that the King James gave uh, kind of leaves much to be desired. Uh, I'll, I'll put it gently that way. I'm grateful to have the King James Bible. But even when I first started this journey 25 years ago, I could barely read it because there was so much of it that just didn't make sense. Uh, I used to work for lawyers, and and I worked in real estate, you know, uh, with the city. So things had to be clear. And yet the King James Bible was anything but. So I started buying special Bibles and studying those, and then I finally ended up with the computer Bible that I have now. I've had it for about 20 years, and I love it because it gives me about 20 versions of different Bibles as well as commentaries, but specifically (laughs) I have the Hebrew and the Greek. So I study all of them. Wow, wow, wow. You remind me of myself. I, um, I'm i an English teacher, and so to me, it's like when I get to a phrase in Scripture, I'm like, wait a minute. I need to know why. I need to know who they're talking to. And so and yes. the meaning <laughs> of specific words are, I have to go and find the, the meaning, the original meaning. And so it sounds like um, that's, that's the same thing that I do as well because I – and it just – gives me such new meaning, and it is, it is amazing. Um, and one book, um, I'm not sure if you've ever tried it, it's called The Complete Jewish Bible, and it takes you back to the original Hebrew language, so that's something to kind of think about. Um, oh, I'll keep that in mind. Let me write that down. The complete. I've probably got it on my phone uh, as well as my computer, by, but I think that's on my phone. But the complete Jewish Bible, yeah. Because their word, you know, they used one word for like a whole sentence. And our language is nothing like that in comparison. So when they were talking to one another, um, you know, it's like the word, I'll use this one word. You know, we're always talking about, you know, we're a sinner and we're a sinner this and sinner that. That is not the word that the Jewish people used. When they told somebody that they were out of order, where we have replaced it with the word sinner, they were either telling them that they had missed the mark or Jesus was not the right goal. They were heading towards the right goal. They had missing missing the mark. Now, that's what their word said. We took all of that and came up with this word sin. So when you wow. look up the et- the etymology of the word sin, that's not what the Jewish people used. So if you tell a person, for instance, and I keep telling, uh, or I suggest, let me put it that way, I said instead of telling a person that they're just a sinner, you know, before God changes your heart, if you tell that person that you're, I know you're trying to give your life to Jesus, but you're missing the mark, you're off target a little bit, then aren't you going to get that person's attention more than just saying, oh, you're just a sinner and you just like to sin? Because that's what we actually, within some religious circles, that's what we actually do. We tell people they like sinning, and they don't even know what the word means. But anyway, that's my little my little tiff. <laughs> you know, give give people the right words. You know, if we're going to use the Jewish teachings, teach it right. But then we're not up under the law. But even then, Jesus kept referring, you know, because the first disciples were Jewish. So 
uh, he was talking with them and dealing with them based on the Jewish words. But, like I said, over the years we've done so much, uh, we're losing people. I'll just leave it at that. We're losing people because we're not making it plain about how much God loves us and how valuable we are. Um, in fact, somebody, uh, you know, there's, uh, Jesus says the first commandment, you know, is love God the Father with all your heart, body, soul, and strength. And the second commandment is love the neighbor as thyself. Well, about two weeks ago, I started Pope making Christian posts about who's on second. And I said, you're on second. That's how valuable you are. And do you know, Pastor Denise, people were arguing with me. I mean, online, they were arguing with me that they were not the second person, that the neighbor was the second person. I said, no, it is impossible to love a neighbor if you do not love yourself. And I said, I'm not talking about narcissistic love like the world promotes. I'm talking about when we look in the mirror, we should see somebody that God loves so much that before we were even a twinkle in our mama's eye, he had set up his own son to sacrifice his life for us to bring us home. Now, you can't get any more valuable and loved than that. Amen, amen, amen. And what we don't realize while you were saying they were arguing, we don't realize if we can't love ourselves, love God, love ourselves, how can we love anybody else? And so we, yes, it's impossible. we forget about that, you know, because we don't know how to love. We have to learn that love from God. I was just um, praying about that one day, and I said, God, you know, we can't possibly, I believe I was reading in Timothy, and in the book of Timothy, when they were talking to the ministers, Apostle Paul talked to the, um, Timothy about the ministers, the people ministering. I said, but God, we can't possibly love or minister in love if we don't know what love is from you and you teach us how to love ourselves. So that is so true. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why the first thing, uh, and this is my first book, which is Mine and Unexpected uh, Deliverance, but that was my first book, uh, and I take people on the journey with me where he kind of did a, a Ruth and Naomi thing with me. My second husband uh, was Naomi to me. Uh, he believed in God, but he was living in the world, but he had been raised up in the church. So, And I used to tell him after we got married, if I had known you were a preacher's kid, I wouldn't have had anything to do with you. But God had his plan. I had mine, and God had his plan. And so after we got together, I would watch him because there was just this kindness in him. And I had never seen that kind of kindness. So like Ruth with Naomi, Ruth had probably never experienced such overwhelming acceptance and kindness. Because even when her husband was gone, she told Naomi, uh, I'm not leaving you. She said, in fact, <laughs> your God is going to be my God. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to show people. Not enabling, uh, but just overwhelming love for a person because she would not have gone with Naomi if Naomi had treated her like an outsider. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Miss Muriel, for sharing. You have blessed me, blessed me, blessed me um, in this interview. And um, can you tell the audience how they can connect with you, follow you, or purchase your materials? Okay, uh, I am on Facebook, which is, uh, what is it, facebook.com slash muriel.gladney. That's my Facebook account. Uh, I am also on um, 
the internet. Uh, my email is Muriel G. My first name, the letter G. Dot writer at yahoo dot com. If they have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me or get in touch with me on Facebook. I would love to hear from people. Uh, I love have you know having questions asked. Uh, because we're told, come together, encourage one another, lift one another up, uh, correct one another. <laughs> I tell my friend, I said, oh, yeah, pull my coattail if you see me getting out of order. But, you know, we've gotten to the point where we don't like to do that because you have some people that don't respond, you know, maybe correctly. But I know... I need help, I need encouragement, and I try to encourage. And it all has to be done in love. But thank you for inviting me on. Oh, you're welcome. I have enjoyed, enjoyed it, enjoyed it. Um, We're going to go ahead and close with prayer. And, um, again, thank you for sharing. Father, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for Miss Muriel. We thank you, oh God, for the work that you still have yet to be done through her. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for her hand. We thank you for her heart. We pray, O oh God, that you would just bless her, bless those that encounter her. We pray, Father God, that whoever has listened to this show, Father, we pray, O oh God, that they would come to the true hope and know that there's no other hope. Father, we give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. The same, amen, amen. <laughs> so are we still on the line? Yes. Thank you all for tuning in to Hope in Christ with Denise here on Kingdom Influences broadcast. Have a phenomenal day.